This is Robert Capuccio. Welcome to the Self Help Antidote, a weekly dose of reason, perspective, and insight, where we challenge conventional thinking and explore authentic strategies and insights around personal transformation. Our commitment to you is to bring you some of the world's leading experts in the domains of fitness, wellness, coaching, and behavior change, separating fact from fallacy. Dr. Bragg, welcome to the Self-Help Antidote. It's a pleasure to have you. Pleasure to be here, Robert. Thanks for inviting me. So let me unpack this a little bit because your list of accomplishments is, is pretty wide and deep. So you are an orthopedic surgeon. You are a corporate trainer, speaker, author, coach. Okay, before we go any further, just for the sake of clarity, is there anything you do not do? Maybe we could well, start there. Let's just be straight. I'm not an orthopedic surgeon. I treat people with orthopedic pain. I'm an interventional pain specialist. So in other words, I provide people with non-surgical treatments for their orthopedic problems so that hopefully they won't have to have surgery. What people don't realize, Robert, that only 5% of people who have back pain really need back surgery. But because people don't know about pain specialists and the non-surgical options, for their pain, in the United States, over 600,000 back surgeries are done a year. Wow. So you, you have people that don't require surgery getting surgery. I think that's, that, that, that's something that most people would want to avoid tenaciously if they could. Right. They would want to avoid it. And obviously, like I said, if you have 100 people, out of that 100 people, about five would need surgery. And you just want to make sure that you've tried the non-surgical treatments to see if you got better if you're one of the unfortunate ones that ends up in that uh, five out of 100. And we could circle back there because there's a good portion of our audience that comes from the fitness industry and the wellness industry. Not everyone, but there's a good percentage of listeners right now who would be very interested in that. One connection I want to make, how does someone go into medicine and then you become a speaker, a corporate trainer, a coach. Those two things usually don't show up in the same space. How did that happen? Well, the reason that happened is when I was in college at the University of Alabama, I found myself in an audience uh, class of about 400 people. And the teacher loved to call on me, Robert, and have me to answer questions. And at 18, 19 years old, I didn't know the answers. I was frightened, I was intimidated, but I knew that I had to pass that chemistry class in order to reach my goals. And so my parents told me that you need to turn this into the Winifred Bragg show and don't let this man intimidate you so you can reach your goals. And I think Robert, that's when the Bragg factor was born. I didn't know that then, but I had to learn how to then fake it till I made it. In other words, I had to study hard and learn how to articulate it in such a way that by the end of the semester, he had to stop calling on me. And I learned at an early age how important effective communication was for people's success. And so what happened when I was in medical school in my residency training, when we would round on patients, you know, Robert is a 25 year old with back pain. My, my colleagues would say, Winifred, can you show me how to make mine smooth and present that way? So I learned then that I had a skill of coaching people uh, in doing presentations. And so one thing led to the other. And that's what happened. So think about how that happened. There's a lot of negative connotations around the phrase, fake it till you make it. And I love that you took a step back and said, well, let me explain what I mean by that. It doesn't mean that you were pretending to be someone or to possess something you didn't. You cultivated a future image of yourself, just the future version of yourself. And you stepped into the behaviors that bridge that gap between where you currently were and what you were becoming in that moment and directed that. That's correct. Uh, I had to bridge the gap between where I was as a college student, teacher calling on me. I had to bridge that gap and know that I had to go from where I was to where I wanted to be but I had to be able to communicate and be able to stand in front of audiences and be able to articulate and sound intelligent and competent in order to reach my goals. And so that's what I mean by fake it till you make it. And so I just get it in my head, 
change my mindset. And so when I tell people, we all have times when we are frightened and we are afraid and don't know what to do. But that's when you have to change your mindset. Because if we don't learn how to work through pain, that was painful for me. That was disappointing to me. I didn't know if college was going to work out when this man was doing that. And so I was really frightened at that point. But we all have those pivotal points in our lives where we are afraid. And what I tell people, you have to jump into the pain, jump into that discomfort zone. Because as long as you stay in your comfort zone, you will never grow and bridge the gap that you talked about. There's something else there, though. There's something else I noticed in that story. And people a lot of times double down on, well, that's just not me. That's not who I am. You have no idea who you are until you start to experiment and step out and express yourself in the world. Because had you not crystallized a vision of who you wanted to become and jumped into the behaviors that would allow you to evolve into that person, you wouldn't have had any insight as to who you were in terms of speaking, presenting, and how you could be of value to other people who are going through the same human experience that you're going through. So it, your self-awareness came from exploration. Correct. That's correct. And sometimes you don't know who you are and what you can become. And so you sometimes have to make a pivot shift and give yourself a chance to grow. I tell people the brag factor that I have is five steps. And that first G in brag, B-R-A-G-G, stands for grow your gift. You see, being a coach and a speaker wasn't what I was trained to do, but it's my gift and I've grown that gift. And sometimes you have a gift that's a better skill than what you were trained to do. I have people that I coach and sometimes they can take their hobby, something they just have a passion for. And that ended up being a better vocation for them than the skill they had. And so you're right. You have to allow yourself to grow, grow your passion and grow into that person that you maybe didn't even know you had the skills to become. So it's not just a matter of what you're willing to pursue. It's also a matter of what you're willing to let go of when you start to discover things within you that that light you up as it adds value to other people. You're right. I say in uh, in reaching a goal, I say there are four questions that I ask whenever I have a goal, something I want to do. I say goals equal W to the fourth power. You have to say, what is it I want? What is it I really want? And then you have to give it a time frame. When do I want it? But the third and one of the most important things is what's holding me back? Why have I not been able to achieve that? And people don't realize that is the key to why we don't go from where we are to where we want to be. That's when we have that serious head talk with ourselves and say, what's holding me back? Why can't I do this? And it's those fears and those things that, that you haven't really wanted to acknowledge about yourself, that when you work through that, you can get through any goal you want, and then you come up with the strategy. But you really have to get clear on what is it you really want. Because sometimes if we worry about the how we're going to do it, you see, when I was in that college class, I didn't really know exactly how I was going to do it, but I knew what I really needed mm -hmm. to do. And so when you really have a goal, if you get clear on the what and the why it is, then you become convicted about it. And some kind of way you can stumble into the how. Yeah. But if you start up, well, how am I going to do this? How am I going to start this business? How am I going to raise my family and do this? That's too much for your mind to conceive. You get clear on why you want to do it and what's mm -hmm. holding you back. And then I found in time, the how will come to you and you stumble forward. As opposed to tackling that all at once, talking yourself out of the journey before you take a single step. Before you take a step, you can talk yourself out the journey. And then sometimes when I learn it, what's really important is who are you surrounding yourself with? And that's really important. Sometimes you have a goal or something you really know you can accomplish and you feel you have the skills to do it. But the person you're talking to at home, the person you're talking to at work, that comes by your desk every morning, that person that calls you on your cell phone first thing in the morning, that's that person that's talking you out of 
when you have a million dollar idea, because we have people who shrink our ideas and then people who stretch them. And so if every time you're saying something to Johnny and Johnny seems to find a way to say, Robert, you can't do it. That's holding you back. Johnny is holding you back. So those four questions, what's holding you back? Number three, mm -hmm. is Johnny holding you back? Is he someone that you may need to prune out of your circle? When you look back over the past whew, more than 50 years now, over half a century, there's been so many pioneers and outright champions in psychology. Solomon Ash comes to mind, Stanley Milgram, Dr. David McClellan, you could go on and right. on, that right. talks about the power of social influences and the people that make up our environment on our own behaviors. But right. you know, I, I want to take a step back for a second because you were talking about the brag factor, which is cleverly based on your surname. So what is the brag factor? The brag factor is what really defines you? What are your unique qualities that define you that would separate you from others? You may say, I'm a doctor, and there are a lot of pain doctors that treat people with orthopedic pain. But as you just said, there are not a lot of doctors that are a speaker and that are a coach as well. So my brag factor is how I'm able to connect with people and communicate. So even when my patients come to me, I'm able to explain to them in a way, just like we are talking today, where they can go home and really have an understanding of why they need to do certain things. Because speaking and teaching and education and communicating and making sure that I'm connecting and empowering people is what I like to do. So my brag factor, that's my, uh, my brag factor is how I'm able to connect with people, communicate with them, and help people to go from where they are to where they want to be. So what is your unique thing? I tell people to write down what are three unique things that you think define you, and that's your brag factor. And then there are steps to the brag factor system. The brag factor has five steps in the framework that helps you to flow through it. But first it starts with defining what is unique about you. So it's not about being egotistical. It's about even if you occupy a common space, what are the distinctions that you have based on your makeup, your skill set, your background, your filter that allow you to communicate and connect in a way that's unique and uniquely valuable? The, the question that comes up in my mind is, what if somebody says, you know what, Dr. Bragg, I really don't know. I think it's this, but I'm not sure. Well, that comes up often. And what I say is, just like I told you earlier, people in medical school and my residency would start saying, Winifred, show me how to present a patient that way. And some of these people were very competent, very skilled physicians. But I started listening to them and the way they would articulate and communicate things, it was confusing. And so when people start coming to me, I realized that I did have that special skill with doing that. So what you will find is that your friends, your family, they will seek you out. And when you start seeing a pattern, people are coming to me for this. It may be, for instance, it may be you're going to a party or going to something really where you need to look sharp. There's going to be some people that you're going to say, which tie, which shirt. Some people can put that stuff together. And you sort of know that they had an eye for colors. They had an eye for graphics. They had an eye for that kind of thing. And so people will start coming to you for certain things. And soon you will realize, I must have a gift, a skill in this, because this is what people are always asking me about. So what are the questions that you're sought out continually to answer? Say again now. So how you how you can arrive at your USP, for lack of a better word, your unique right. selling proposition, right. is paying attention to what do people seek me out for? What's the right. what's the most common question people present to me when they're looking for help in a certain area? That's right. When people are looking for help in a certain area, you notice they come to you for that. And you start looking at it. And then you may go back and ask the people, you know, you asked me about this. Why did you ask me that? And they'll say, well, do you recall when I had a similar problem with that two years ago? You helped me. 
And I realized out of all the people I talked to, you were really good at that. And I helped. It may be finances. It may be, like I said, interior design. I had a young woman who came to a workshop and she was in a marketing program in college. She wanted a marketing degree. But her passion and her skills was graphic artists. That was her hobby. She now has her own business where she does development of websites and that kind of thing because we, she found out that it was her hobby that was really driving her and that's what people would seek her out for. And so she now has a, a business doing quite well uh, with uh, having advanced her hobby rather than what she was trained to do. So that's what you have to look at. Why do these people keep asking me this? And then if you go back to them, if you need to deep dive, they will tell you. So I hear what advice am I sought after for most frequently? But there's right. also this intrinsic voice that you have to pay attention to. I had a conversation recently mm -hmm. and someone's career came to an abrupt end at the onset of COVID. Mm -hmm. And rather than doing what this individual always does, which is jump into action, they just sat with it for a little while. And, so, and they asked themselves a question. What is it that I am saying yes to? What is it that pulls me toward it where I will seek this out without even realizing I am chasing this because it means something. So that's an intersection that, that makes sense. What do people seek me out for? And what do I get excited about engaging with people about? When you have those two elements. And then there's a third thing I'm, I think I'm hearing from you. There's also got to be a level of empathy. empathy. Understanding right. and appreciating and ministering to what people need. Mm -hmm. And see what I tell people, when you have a client, a customer, and you're in a business, you know, people think, well, you need to sell somebody something. And how do you sell people? No, what you want to do is think about how can I serve you? And when you really serve people, then you find out that because you serve them, that's the empathy. That's where you're going to really get the satisfaction of serving them. And through that, you'll be successful. And so that's why I tell people, brag factor, that second G in brag is the most important letter in the five steps of the brag factor stands for gratitude because we want to do things from a standpoint of gratitude. And that's what you're talking about, the empathy. You're talking about how can I serve you? And when you really serve people and you get deep into that, it's going to help you to grow. Statistics have shown that people who show gratitude are healthier and more successful. And it's because they serve people. And that's what you want to do, serve. Yeah, that, there's there's some promising empirical evidence on the physiological benefits of gratitude. I, th I think also gratitude opens up your mind to possibilities because you're not in a state of threat, which tends to narrow your focus a little bit. So right. there's not a lot of possibilities when you're responding to threat. The, the, the thing that's most prominent in your field of vision is wherever that threat is coming from. So when you, right. it's kind of like when people say, well, you're grateful for something, more things start to show up. I don't know if that's a spiritual thing or if that's a perceptual thing, but it's true nonetheless. It is true. When you're in a state of gratitude and you're really doing it from a point of sincerity, you, you're, like you say, you're uninhibited. Your mind is free to think and you can deep dive and really think about what is good that I can do here. And through that state of gratitude, you see that you can grow. And then you will look back on the things and, and realize how you went from point A to point B, and you were really serving and giving. Well, well let's talk about your journey from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. At what point did you go from practicing medicine to saying, okay, now I'm going to step on stage. Now I'm going to start presenting to audiences. What was that like in the very beginning? How did you, how did you get your, your, your first speaking engagement and step out in front of an audience and get that response? Well, part of mine did come from medicine because companies used to hire me mm. to educate doctors about different strategies to treating uh, pain. 
And so they would hire me to teach doctors different things about different medications or whatever. And in doing that, as a young doctor, I realized I was good because a lot of people would show up. And that's how I was able to build a very thriving practice by doing that. But also during my residency, I was given the opportunity to do a internship at the Surgeon General's office in Washington, D.C. Mm. And one day the Surgeon General wasn't able to do this speech. And they said to her, listen, you can't do it. What about that young doctor that follows you around? Can she do anything? And I'm like, wow. And it was a talk at the U.S. Capitol, but take our daughters to work national program. And all these mentors were going to bring these young women to the Capitol to mentor them. And they needed someone to do a speech. She said, well, yeah, that's a good idea. So I was kind of thrown to speak at the U.S. Capitol and so when I did that, that was perhaps my first motivational speech at that big stage. It was well received. And from that, people then start asking me to speak to high schools and college to motivate other people about going into medicine, science. And so that's what happened with that. And then eventually I segued away about 15 years ago and created the Bragg Factor because I realized a lot of very competent people, very skilled and knowledgeable people had difficulty saying good things about themselves and it was holding them back. Ah, so there's things that we do, but then there's the realm of being. So in that moment, you were ready because you were being prepared. You were being courageous. You took a step. That, That was an opportunity that presented itself. It could have gone quite differently, but you were like, this is my time. And you stepped up there. It was my time. And a friend of mine said, girl, you have to do it. The U.S. Capitol, this is your time. You have to do it. And so I worked very, very hard on that speech and I did it and it was uh, uh, accepted. And so that's what helped me to then bridge to the other area of start doing somewhat leadership training, motivational training and that kind of thing. I got to take you back again because something else just popped into my head. I'm curious about. You said that was my first motivational speech. You have an you have an audience of people in the medical field. Were they expecting a motivational speech, or is a motivational speech what they got unexpectedly? If that makes any sense, I understand. It was the U.S. Capitol, so they were expecting the Surgeon General, so they wanted mm-hmm. someone to be motivational. And so I spoke on the importance of believing in yourself. And ironically, as a small child. Uh, I lived in Birmingham, Alabama, and my parents, one of my biggest trips was a train ride from Birmingham to Washington, D.C., which was a big deal. And my parents took me there and, you know, we did the mall on Washington and all of that. And they took me to that reflecting pool. And I remember because my mother would always tell me this story that she wanted me to always believe in the little girl that I saw in that reflecting pool. And she said that if I could believe in her, I could become anything I wanted to become. And so I pretty much told him that story that I had come there as a small child. And this is where I learned the importance of my parents taught me about believing in myself. So that was what they came expecting a motivational speech because they wanted the Surgeon General to motivate them. Wow. It's it's, it's not just what you did. It's what you didn't do. You didn't step up there on stage and say, okay, I'm filling in for the Surgeon General. Okay, what would the Surgeon General say? It's like, no, what is deeply resonant within me? Because when you when you're when you're on stage, I've I've probably done over whew, over a thousand seminars myself. Uh-huh. There is that resonance. So even though they're not talking to you in the seats, they are communicating. And that resonance is is deep and it's heartfelt when it's coming from a place of something quite real inside of you. So you stepped on that stage knowing, yeah, I'm filling in for the Surgeon General, but I cannot be anyone else other than me. I can deliver no other message than my message, my story. And that's what's either going to connect or not connect. And in your case, it connected really well. And there were so many opportunities that spun out from that which I think another lesson I'm pulling out there 
for the audience is you got to grab on something because you don't, you don't know what's in front of you. You cannot predict the future. You can only step into the opportunities in the present and do the best you can with them. I heard someone once said that opportunities are like counting the hair on a bald headed man's head. (laughs) (laughs) And so that was the one hair. And so I had to go at that one hair at that time. And so it was an opportunity. I loved it. And when I was received, well received, I realized that then I could make that pivot and I could do that. And it taught me the value also of story, of how much story is important when you communicate with people. People want to know the story. And so although when I would speak to those doctors circling back around medical things, I realized one of the unique things about my talks is that I would always tell stories when I would tell them about how to treat this person or whatever. I would try to integrate stories because people hold on to stories much more than they do a lot of statistics and graphs and those kind of things. And so that was a good thing to teach me about story. Every time I speak to someone without exception that has done exceedingly well and by exceedingly well, they move people in their space around public speaking. And I said, well, what is one piece of advice you would give? Story always comes up, always. And a lot of times people who don't speak or present, they'll have an idea about, oh, well, if I was up there, I would do it this way. How do we use story when when we're on multiple stages in our life. So somebody listen to this might not get up in front of a giant audience, but they hold meetings or they, they, they work with people one-on-one. How does story get integrated into those situations effectively? Well, I think story gets into because, you know, story makes it real. It makes it relatable. It makes it where people can understand it. You know, if I am talking to, Uh, a person that I'm coaching and they're having difficulty with, you know, maybe getting out of their comfort zone, then the fact that I can share with them stories of other clients or stories that I struggled with and how people overcame it, people understand it. So the same thing, I think a meeting, a seminar is very powerful. If you're teaching a point that you can tell a story about it and then go to the teaching point. And sometimes you can do what we call a split story. Start with the story, do a teaching point, and then go back to the end of the Mm. story. And so then, therefore, the people got your factual stuff. You sandwich that in between. You did a little story at the beginning, sandwich the facts in the the middle, and then story it at the end. And it's like taking home a Burger King or a McDonald's Whopper. uh, Whopper. They got a little bit of all of it and packaged because you did story and the facts, and they take them home with that. And that works well. That's called split story. My wife is a filmmaker. And Uh one of the interesting things, she deals with visceral human issues. Mm. And in her films, a lot, you could say that she gives a voice to the voiceless. But sometimes what she makes films about is confronting. And it deals with certain, I, I wouldn't say just societal issues, but what it means to be human, like the struggle and the redemption and that transcendence. And a lot of times, if you would just get up and talk to people about that, they have their own ideas and belief systems and those constructs give them a sense of safety. So people protect those zealously. So it's like, do I agree with this or do I not agree with that? Does that make a, a story allows them to kind of circumvent that and, and project themselves into the space of the protagonist right. and not have that filter that doesn't allow ideas to get in, to, to permeate, to affect them. I think as a society, we would be further along politically or whatever you want to say, if we could allow story, because story would help us to understand other people's history, their struggles, And then, like you say, the filters could be removed. And I think it would help us to move forward when we do stories about, when we talk about story rather than just hitting the facts. And that's what I find when I'm in groups of people and we're trying to talk of diverse groups. I always tell people, well, tell me about your background, your family, 
where you came from, what was your family struggles to help me to understand? Because I haven't lived in every country. I don't know every language, but if you can appreciate the other person's story, you understand their history. And I think that bridges gaps. You just brought up a unique point. A lot of people in society are struggling in our interaction with one another. Right. And this is becoming more and more of a global issue because we're starting to use, despite the differentiation across cultures, we're using the same mediums of communication that cross-pollinates globally. Right. And it seems to be these monologues and sound bites that we not share with one another, but direct at one another. Mm -hmm. Story takes... It doesn't need to take time, but it requires presence. It's high. It's a, it's highly based on participation, not just the storyteller, but the listener. You're all participating to give life to this story. And if we're not spending time doing that, like no matter if you look at Joseph Campbell's meta myth and you take a look at any culture, any religion, it's been cultivated and propagated through story. And if you start to remove that from day-to-day interactions, I wonder if that's partly responsible for how fragmented we seem to be becoming. That's, that's very interesting. I think it is. I think that some of the social media things that you know we do and you just say, someone's loved one dies. What do you put like? You know, someone put on there that their loved one died, their mother died, and what does people get on there? Like? Now, what is that saying? And so people would rather say, well, did you call someone when their mother died? No, I just Facebooked them. You're right. We missed the story. And so you missed the empathy of the sharing that moment with the person for getting the feelings and and helping them because all you did was got away with a, a Facebook post of telling them, like, And I think, how unlikable is that? (laughs) Well, I think that goes back to being versus doing. When someone has someone dear to them that dies, there's nothing that you can say. It's like, well, here's what I did. I wrote this. A lot of times what that person requires is not what you're going to do for them, but what are you going to be with them? sitting in it with that person. Right. That's right. Mm. And like you said, there's no perfect thing you can say or whatever. It's the being. But I think you need to do a little better than just sending a like. Yeah. I I would tend to agree with that. Right. So within all your domains in which you work with people, whether it's the corporate coaching or or the, the speaking, the training, working with your patients, what what are the commonalities that you see in people that you find most encouraging? What I find uh, most encouraging is that people want to be able to share things about them. Uh, if people are uh, different, you know, I live in a military town, Virginia Beach, Norfolk area, big Navy areas. And so people have traveled all over the world. They come from all over the world from here. I grew up in Alabama and One of the things that has helped me as a speaker, as a doctor, as a person, is because my patients have taught me so much over the past 25 years by opening up their stories and sharing their life with me. So I have traveled through them. And I think that that's one of the unique things that people don't understand is sometimes people think, well, they say, Dr. Bradway, you break this down to us as a doctor. You should want every doctor to be able to break it down to you where you understand it. I don't know how to fix an air conditioner. I don't know about plumbing, but I don't let a plumber or an HVAC guy come into my home that cannot ex- make me understand at least what he's doing. You mm-hmm. want to bridge that gap. And so I've learned about so many professions because my patients have educated me about the nuances of so many things. And through that, I learned about skills and that's how I was able to learn how to coach people as well, because sometimes my patients would lose jobs and they would share that with me. They were devastated about it. And so I learned about talking to them about their skill sets 
and how they could pivot, shift, and do other things. And so sometimes in that visit, they would share those vulnerable things to me because their identity was based upon what they did. And I used to help people all the time, you know, I'm a doctor, but it's not who I am. Who I am mm-hmm. is when it would brag, whatever. So you don't lose you because you lost that job. And these are your skill sets that we can look at or you can look at exploring to get another job. I had a guy who was a pharmacist and he made six figures and he had a disability and he wasn't able to uh, continue standing at a retail pharmacy. You know, that's hard work. And he was losing his identity. And I told him, yeah. you don't lose you, because let me tell you what, to become a pharmacist, you had to do all of these other things, write down your skills. What are those unique things about you? What are good about you? What are those skills? And then you can go now on LinkedIn and other places and find who needs those skills. And that's what I tell people. And I've learned so much about that. And I uh, thank my patients so much for treating me that. And that's what has made me a good coach to people for corporate training, because my patients, the medical school didn't teach me that. They taught me all those things in my one-on-one interactions during the last 27 years. That is a very useful distinction. Break down what are the strengths, the resources, the attributes, the skill sets that make you you a good pharmacist, a good mixologist, right. if you are, what, whatever accountant, and those are those are attributes that can be repurposed or used to broaden your scope of influence. There, right. In a book that I have written, I have people to write down their skills. For instance, if you work at a fast food restaurant, well, it's not that you took Robert's order for an orange soda versus a Coke or a Pepsi. You gave him a Pepsi and he wanted an orange soda. That wasn't the skill set. The skill set that you learned in that was conflict resolution because a person is mad when they wanted a Pepsi and you gave him an orange soda. And this was how effective you did that. And conflict resolution can be used in a lot of businesses. So people have to learn their skill set. And that was my goal for teaching people about brag because brag teaches you What is good about you? What is your value? How do you own and communicate your value? So your value wasn't the orange soda, the Pepsi, the Coke. Your value was when it got mixed up, how you smoothed it over. And that was the conflict resolution. And see, people pay for problem solving. And I tell people, you can have any good job, any good business, if you start with the pain. What is the pain that you are solving? You hear from people increasingly so, unfortunately. Oh, I, I, you know, I just, I'm not happy with my job. You know, this isn't me. And understandable, you know. Right. Explore options that might be more suited to you or think about what you value and how you can align the work that you're currently doing with what's most meaningful to you. One story that's come up in the past couple of days. I I don't know why I'm just fixated on it comes out of the Freiburg's book nuts about Southwest airlines where a ticket agent on a fairly regular basis would address life altering problems and help people that were absolutely desperate and helpless. And it's like, yeah. are you really a ticket agent or is that a role that you step into to help solve problems that are critical to people's immediate situation in that time to their mental health, they might be struggling with bereavement. You know, one guy was an old man dropped off at the curb. He was confused. He had no idea how to get back home. And these group of committed people would collaborate and strategize creatively to create solutions that meant everything in the world to these particular individuals. And see, that's because that ticket agent wasn't just a ticket agent. That was someone who was thinking about what I told you, service. Mm -hmm. What can I do to serve the people? What is really the problem here? The problem really isn't about my baggage. The problem really isn't about my flight to Norfolk or Virginia Beach. It was really those other things that you pointed out when those people were at the end of the road. And if we all kind of walked in that, the world would be so much a better place. 
the world would be a better place. And I also think that we as individuals would be in a better place psychologically and emotionally. What's interesting to me is the very things that we strive for, those actions we take are the behaviors that stop us from having what we want most, where sometimes it's helping other people get what they want that indirectly, spontaneously, and sometimes unavoidably elevates us in the process. You know, I think it was Zig Ziglar who said that if we would take time helping other people get what they need, Mm -hmm. we would then reciprocally get what we want if we focus on what other folks need. And that is so true. And it takes us to another level when we're focusing on someone else, because then we can give our best self when we're focusing on someone else's needs rather than just our own. And let's talk about focusing on you for a bit. Where can we get more of you? So where can we get your books? You know, where can we get a hold of you on your website? Where can somebody book you, maybe, if they're Thank looking you. for a presenter? You can b- go to my website, thebragfactor.com, and it's going to have all my information there. All my books are on Amazon. I have a new bestseller on how to create your brag book for a competitive job market, and it's for professionals. And it teaches you about looking at your skills and how you look at your skills and how you can make a pivot. You know, with COVID and the pandemic, a lot of us had to make different pivot shifts. And so it talks about how you assess your skills and what you can do to make yourself more marketable. So you can go there. And then when you go to thebragfactor.com, I also have a YouTube where I give what I call tips for a terrific Tuesday every Tuesday on my YouTube channel, The Brag Factor. So that's how you can book me, go onto the website, And put the brag factor, you'll find my email address and everything right there on the bragfactor.com. And I would love to speak to your group and and to see how I can help you, coach you, and help you to go from where you are to where you want to be. Well, I know a lot of people are looking forward to checking that out. Thank you, Dr. Bragg, for your generosity. It was great having you here. And thank you, Robert, for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Visit us at theselfhelpantidote.com to share your feedback, insights, and recommendations on what topics you'd like us to explore in the future.